my friends. Welcome to Breakfast with Sergio. This is episode number 79, and I'm super excited because I have with me a special guest, uh, and we have Jaime Guzman, who is an attorney here in Chicago. Good morning, Jaime. How are you? Good morning, Sergio. Thank you for having me. No, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is going to be an awesome, awesome series of episodes. So Jaime is going to join us not only for today, but we have the opportunity to hear from him, from his expertise. Uh, for the next few episodes so don't miss all the series on uh, copyright law for visual artists so Jaime uh, you know reach out to me and say hey Hans, okay, we had to help the art community bring light to some of the issues that a lot of times as artists we don't think about a lot of times kind of we uh, we just make the work but the you know the loss is the last thing that we start thinking about how to protect ourselves how to protect the work that we do and how do we make sure not to infringe also in copyright issues as well. So, Jaime, welcome to the show. Tell us uh, in uh, two seconds a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, I'm a, I'm a Chicago native. Uh, both of my parents are originally from Guanajuato, Mexico. Uh, I was raised I was raised in a little village. Uh, I've uh, I've spent uh, a, a good portion of a decade working in nonprofit organizations. And after that, I, I uh, went to law school uh, with one of the intentions was to come back with some knowledge that I could share for the local arts community, uh, especially because my, my wife's an artist, uh, my son's an artist, my, my son's a awesome. clay artist. Um, yeah. And, you know, th these are the sort of things that uh, for, for many artists, from an informational standpoint, they can be very daunting. Uh, mm -hmm. But the reality is if they're broken down into simple terms and you go away from all the legalese, uh, mm -hmm. You'll see that you are able to, we are all able to understand it um, and hopefully move in a direction where the artists can not just focus on the artwork, but also focus on enterprising their work so that they can live mm -hmm. off. Awesome. awesome. Beautiful. And thank you so much for bringing your knowledge here to share with the friends at Breakfast with Sergio. Uh, well, the first question, what do you bring for breakfast? <laughs> I'm, actually ha I'm actually having a, a couple of espresso shots this morning. <laughs> Uh, that, that's my that's my usual routine. Um, that's your that's the wake up call, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, I uh, I no longer make the mistake of having coffee after after two o'clock, cause then I don't sleep. So I get all, I get all of it in in the morning. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Jaime. And my friends, so today we're gonna talk about who owns the copyright of my work. Who owns the copyright? A question that as artists we all need to know the answer. So take it away, Jaime. Help us a little bit to understand who owns the copyright. Sure. So uh, there are there are three different sort of approaches to owning a copyright. One is uh, an individual owner having sole authorship, and then there's uh, them collaborating with somebody and there being a joint authorship. And then there's a third aspect that that many artists run into issues with, with because it's the work made for hire. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the like one with a lot. exactly, and mm -hmm. but unfortunately, that's the, the 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 largest amount of cases where people lose their copyrights is within the works made for hire because of who is paying for the work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and many artists fall in, fall in, in unfortunate situations because of that. Uh, but in order for us to really get a, a good handle on what those three things are, it's important to understand what it means to have something that is copyrightable, right? Uh, it's not enough to just say I created something and I put it out there and now it's, it should be copyright protected, right? Um, under which, the which law- Which is kind of like the general you know, idea that most people have. Yeah, and that's because we have a, we have a long history in this country where, where we've absorbed many sort of international laws as well. Uh, but we have a long history where people talk about sort of the common law protection that people obtain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was the case quite a bit ago, but the, the thing is that the laws have changed, um, especially in copyright since 1976, much has changed. Uh, that's pretty much uh, one of the last few times that the Copyright Act was, was amended. And what that means is it's not enough to just say I created something, I, I put it out there and I'm the sole owner, right? Now, um, for quite some time now, for a few decades, it's important that a piece of work has two major main elements into the work, and that is that it has to be original and it has to be fixed. 
um, many people run into the, the into problems when it comes to originality, mm -hmm. right? Fixation isn't really much of an issue because fixation focuses on um, what did you put it on? Is it fixed on something? Oh. Uh, and, I usually, got you. Okay. and usually visual artists, they do a good job of, you know, they, they put it on canvas, they put it on something else. Uh, they even put it on the street, right? Uh, one of those things that I think we'll eventually talk about is maybe graffiti art. Um, right. Uh, uh, because that there's a, there's still a lot to be decided about that, but in essence, the fixation part is 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 the easier part, right? It's you put it on something and it's fixed. Uh, there's other mediums that wrestle with that sort of thing, right? Like like film mm -hmm. and video and, and other things, um, um, or even performance, right? Performance right. is the biggest one that has an issue with fixation because it's like, where did you put it? Well, <laughs> right. if it's not if it's not filmed or anything, it's hard to say where I put it, right? Uh, <laughs> And so uh, the, the one that people run into as far as issues is originality, right? Okay. Because um, part, copyright stems as a, is, is one, of the, um, one of the things that are protected within the U.S. Constitution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to intellectual property, it's copyright and patent that are very explicitly stated within the U.S. Constitution. And if you look at that whole section within the Constitution, it really, uh, it's intended to sort of, uh, to, uh, uh, to encourage innovation and to encourage new work, right? And because of that, uh, the originality aspect is one of those things that, that uh, you know, in the law, we know that people are inspired by different things when they create things. Right. Right. And so, it's important to safeguard those original works in different ways, while at the same time not stifling people's creativity and still allowing them to create new things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, with that said, a lot of folks sort of think that, you know, um, I put something together, it's original, I know it is. Well, it could be, right? It could be original, and then it could mm -hmm. not be, because you don't know exactly the plethora in the world of what's out there. <laughs> Why did they made it on? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's not until you run into something that's similar that there's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of originality, you, you want to make sure that there's some sort of modicum, right? And the law says modicum, um, which means a little bit, right? There has to be a little bit of originality <laughs> just to make it different, right? In order for it to be protected. Mm -hmm. um, just keep that in mind for now as we talk about these other topics but in essence that's kind of where it starts okay but then depending on the situation it goes from a modicum to there's a lot more that that needs to be included for it to be original right a lot more right. effort needs to be included excuse i know that there's been cases where uh the courts have sort of said well it's not enough for there for there to be a modicum of, origi of, of originality there has to be more than what's called the sweat of the brow, right? Huh. It's not enough. It's not enough that you, your eyebrow sweated a little bit to make it, <laughs> right? You needed to go a little farther than that. Okay. Um, so it depends, right? Uh, but again, it, it can vary from a modicum to a little more than the sweat of the brow. But in mm -hmm. essence, there has to be some real effort, and it has to be displayed in the artwork that this is an original piece, right? Mm. So with that said, um, you run into these issues when it comes to the authorship behind it. And one of those things is, well, a lot of times artists, um, if they collaborate with someone, they don't put it in writing, right? Yeah. There's no contract. There's nothing that says, this is mine, that's yours. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the owner, you're the, you're the assistant, or you're the consultant on this, or whatever category they may fall in, right? Mm -hmm. There isn't enough of that done. So a lot of times people fall into, you know, these situations where, well, who owns the copyright? Right. Um, the, can, can a copyright be split? Let's say if two artists collaborated together and, you know, they both put the same amount of effort and whatever, can, can they agree to split copyright between the two? Can a copyright be split between two or multiple parties? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can have a joint authorship of multiple parties of something. Okay. Right. Um, and then, you know, the thing is, it's a property, right? It's a piece of property. Copyright is property. So you can, right. you can sell it. 
right? Those mm -hmm. they can sell it to each other mm -hmm. at some point. So right. it can go it can go from it's it's both of ours to now I want to buy it off you. Give me, you know, right. I'll give you the fair market value for it for the copyright, and now it becomes mine. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And so uh you know when it comes to sole authorship it's it's really straight simple the 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 person that's the sole author is the one that has demonstrated throughout the creative process that they are the one in control hmm. okay um there's different ways of showing that uh as it pertains to like uh painting and other visual arts it's you know there's different ways of documenting how how much of it was your idea uh, it could either be through through notes that were put together. Uh, it could be through other sort of circumstantial evidence that could be shown that this was your idea. Maybe, maybe this is an idea that that is the end result of other projects, and it shows sort of right. progression, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're able to demonstrate that you're the one that was in sole control of the creation. Mm -hmm. um, and then in those and on those occasions where you you you're not able to show who the who the 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 person with the main control is that's when you run into issues about okay who's the owner right who's gonna mm -hmm. who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna who's the one that gets this right um then it sort of goes into this uh uh this dynamic where they each party now has to demonstrate that one was the one with the control and the other one was strictly a consultant got it okay got it. um and that becomes a tough game to play, right? That's <laughs> that's because that's that's uh, that really is a, a who did what, and he didn't mm -hmm. do, and I didn't do, and she didn't do, uh, mm -hmm. in a pointing mm -hmm. finger in a pointing fingers game, right? Uh, no, no artist wants to get to that, especially because most of the time when you're collaborating with someone, it's a friend, it's a family member, mm -hmm. uh, and you don't want to fall in that position, right? Uh, but in essence, the best thing to do is to us to provide enough information to show that each contribution meets mm -hmm. the two major requirements which is originality and fixation okay that's good mm -hmm. so if there's two artists and we don't know who the who the author is then each one of them has to demonstrate that their contributions are original mm -hmm. to the project yeah. Can this be uh, decided prior to, for example, through a contract where there's both artists agree and then there's no dispute afterwards? Yes, there is. In, in general, in the law, not just in copyright, the best thing mm -hmm. to do is to put it in writing. Yeah. Uh, and an even better thing to do is to have good legal counsel to help you figure out and make sure that the clauses all make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, I've run into uh, sort of agreements between people that they drafted themselves. They're cutting and pasting from the internet. Right, and it makes sense to them, right? And, <laughs> and it, it might, but at the end of the day, uh, these sorts of things have to be looked at from an objective lens. And the objective right. lens is really going to look at how these things tie together and whether they do or not, right? Exactly. It's better than, it looks good to me, it doesn't look good to you, right. and you just sign it, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, Very good. Great advice. Yeah. So, so, we, so the courts look at those sorts of things, the contribution, because again, it, there might not be an issue with fixation because we already have the fixation of, because of where, how it's placed or how it was, it was sort of manifested. The issue becomes how much of the contributions are original, right? And then that becomes that that game as well. Well, well, you know, I brought this in and I did that in, um, which then sort of leads us into um, the issues that come from works made for hire, right? Mm -hmm. And works made for hire, um, that one, it, the waters become even murkier because now you're 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 looking at this from well. If we're thinking about the author as the person that's in control, well, who's really in control, right? In a work made for hire. If I if I pay you to do something, right? If I commission you to do something, mm -hmm. am I the one in control or are you? Right? right. That's the right. question. And so that one within itself too becomes a, a very complicated situation. And uh, I'll give you an example of that. Mm -hmm. um, back in the back in the seventies, there was the, uh, this nonprofit uh, organization 
uh, that uh, was focused on, uh, on violence prevention and uh, was also focused on uh, making sure that the homeless in America had, had greater opportunities in life. And what they did was they commissioned an artist to create a sculpture for them. Okay. Okay. And the sculpture was of a, of a nativity scene. Uh, but in, instead of, you know, the traditional players of the nativity right. scene, uh, we had, uh, we had a, a homeless family, right. Okay. Uh, to sort of drive the point home that they're important yeah. people as well in society. So what happened was they commission an artist, they tell mm -hmm. the artist exactly what they want. Yeah. And then the, the artist uh, goes on and the artist goes on and, and, and decides, okay, well, I'm going to work out of my shop, out of mm -hmm. my studio. I'm going to use all my own equipment. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I want you to pay half in advance. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. once it's completed, you pay the other half. Right. Right. Very, it's very usual. That happens often. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and so they give him they give him half the money. He then takes it, starts creating the piece in his shop. On occasion, the leadership of the organization of the nonprofit that commissioned this would come over to the shop to check out the project. Uh -huh. Right. And so they would look at it and say, "Oh, hey, you know, I like this, but can you change this a little bit? And can Difficult. you make that change? <laughs> yeah. Right." Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, you know, as um, you know, one would think, well, they're just kind of nitpicking. But the reality yeah. is they're doing more than nitpicking. Now they're yeah, contributing to, to what the final product's going to be. Right. Yeah. And so there is no agreement at the, for, at the front end. For, OK. Mm -hmm. There is no written agreement. First, first mistake. <laughs> first mistake. This is all word of mouth. Uh -huh. um, and. You know, and it's because it's a nonprofit organization. This is the first time they do something like this. This is an artist, and he's like, "Well, just give me half, and I'm ready to work." Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's how how that dynamic went. So then, what ends up happening is the work they come on, on they come over on on separate occasions, and eventually the work gets finished. The work gets completed, and as soon as the work gets completed, the artist asks for the other half. Mm -hmm. But when he gets the other half, the nonprofit organization begins the process of filing the copyright for themselves of the of the, of the sculpture. <laughs> oh wow! Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. This, this is a true story. This is this is real case law. Okay. Yeah. And so they go and they file the copyright for themselves, <laughs> right? And that and is the artist, not annoying. The artist, the artist didn't find out until later on, until he tried to file the copyright. Wow. He files the copyright and apparently somebody already owns the copyright. Right? And it's <laughs> yeah. the nonprofit organization. So in his mind, you know, the artist is thinking, I need to get a copyright because I can create other works based off yeah. this sculpture, right? Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is uh the artist sues the nonprofit. Or wow. actually, uh yeah, the nonprofit sues the artist, right? And so they go, they go in order for them to get clarification on who owns the copyright. So they go through this thing. I mean, this, this case went from the local courts to uh, the, the, uh, the, the local district courts. It then goes to the appellate court. This case ends up in the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1970s. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening there is the court decides, okay, we have to have some clear measures on what it means to be an independent contractor, okay, mm -hmm. and, and something being, being a work made for hire, all right? Mm -hmm. So they looked at circumstantially, factually, everything that occurred and the approach that the artist took. And they said, okay, well, first of all, you guys just gave him money, right? And then the mm -hmm. artist went home or went to his studio and he, he used, he decided what tools to use, right? And those were his tools. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those were his tools. The material, he chose the material, right? You just, you just mm -hmm. said you wanted a, a sculpture. You didn't say exactly of what. So he mm -hmm. chose the material. Um, he, for the most part, had control and direction of it. And so you guys would show up every now and then and say, hey, we want <laughs> yeah. to change these couple of things, right? Um, 
And so they went through this, this, this whole process of evaluating the power dynamic between the two, right? Mm-hmm. And nowadays, in, 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 in a situation, I think an artist would maybe push back a little bit and say, you know, let me kind of do this. Um, mm-hmm. unless, it's, unless it's some, some big, big money we're talking about, they might say, right. okay, fine, you, know, you can come in and, and, and change a few things. Um, but what ended up happening is where one would think that there should be a clear cut distinction between the artist and the copyright and the person that paid for it. In this case, because they contributed to the final work by making suggestions and changes Mm -hmm. to the, to the sculpture, the, the Supreme court, they gave us the sort of, uh, they gave us the the spectrum from which to work when to decide whether there's an independent contractor or not. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, the outcome of that case, they decided that they were joint authors. Mm-hmm. The yeah. artist was an author and the nonprofit was an author. Like an author. And, then they, and then after all this, they decided they would have a contract in which who would profit from, from the copyright in different ways. Right, right. So, so the, yeah. the, uh, uh, the, the nonprofit decided that they would benefit from the copyright uh, based off uh, any images that could be used off the uh, the sculpture, and then the artist, you know, the actual design of it, he would benefit from, right? Mm. No one mm. wants to be in that position. No one right. wants to be in a position where you have to split your copyright into what can I get, what can I mm-hmm. sell, what can I mm-hmm. make, what can I reproduce? You know, you want to have sole control of these things, right? And so right. that's why it's it's important especially in a work made for hire that mm-hmm. you do not want to fall in a situation where there is no written agreement about who owns mm-hmm. the copyright on the front end, because this analysis is very broad. There's right. a lot of things to consider. Right. Wonderful. And I think that Jaime, that's a really awesome way to finish this episode because you have given us really, really a lot of things to think about. Soul authorship, joint authorship and independent contractor. You have to kind of uh, lay it out in a way that we can understand it. I think it's super clear, super easy to to kind of start with that framework. And like you say, right, avoid some of these headaches in the early on of the process before it's too late. And uh, I think uh, uh, that's so important. Thanks so much Jaime, for that, you know, taking time to explain the law to us in clear terms and to give us some of those you know steps for us to be ready and protected. So my friend, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you are not the only artist. Please share this episode with your friends. We, uh, Jaime and I, we would love if you uh, can help us to spread the love, spread the word, tell uh, other artists about copyright as well. So please uh, share the episode. And don't forget that next uh, episode of The Hell We Tell You, we're going to be talking about can I borrow from other art? That's a really interesting topic too. As an artist, uh, you know, appropriation. Can I appropriate part of another work, a logo, a, a magazine cut out and stick it in my art you know how what does that mean in the law as well so Jaime is going to help us like he did today and put it with great uh, skill break it down in a way that we can all understand it so Jaime thank you so much for uh, joining us today and, my pleasure uh, we look forward to episode number two on uh, can I borrow art from other sources thank you Jaime thank you Sergio thank you have a great breakfast <laughs> yeah, thanks. I gotta finish the rest of my camp. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, my friend. We'll see you next time. Thank you.